This morning I'm speaking on the subject, The Way Home, and um, last Saturday uh, it was my privilege to conduct the memorial service for a dear friend of 53 years in Houston, Texas, there at First Baptist. And um, all the deacons came and so many wonderful friends to celebrate the way home for uh, William Morris. And as I was praying and thinking about Bill, uh, whom I had the privilege of discipling years ago, um, I thought, I think this message would be helpful perhaps today as well. So I've expanded it, and I'd like to give a prologue if I could. It's a little unusual to do that, but Ruth is used to me, and she puts up with me. Um, the prologue is this. You already know these verses, so I'm just going to quote it and let you think about it. Moses begins the Bible, very first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now notice that he used the word heavens plural. It was Paul who later explained to us that there are three heavens. And when we think about going home, how many of us think about going to heaven? Isn't that the first thought on your mind? That is the eternal home that all of us aspire to arrive at. We want to go there. We want to be there. And we want to be with God. How many of you would agree that's true of you? All right, I thought so. Now, with that in mind, I want to explain a little bit about heaven and help you understand it a bit deeper perhaps. When Moses says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, two of those heavens are physical in nature. The sky above the earth is in the Bible called heaven. Additionally, the celestial universe and all the stars that we find so beautiful at night, that also is referred to by the biblical authors as heaven. But there's a third heaven. And Paul went there very temporarily, or at least that's our understanding of what he said. And then, of course, later when he was martyred, he went there permanently. But that third heaven is the one you and I are interested in, and that's home. That's home for uh, first, uh, I'll call it first covenant uh, believers who were Hebrew down through the many centuries. And that's been true for those of us and I always tease my Jewish friends and I'm saying I'm far more Jewish than they are. Uh, because I smile and say I'm a second covenant believer that Jesus Christ was exactly who he said he was, the Messiah. Y'all with me? So we are Hebrew in our faith. We, if you take Hebrew faith and Christianity, they merge together absolutely seamlessly. Now, home for Abraham was that third heaven that Paul mentioned. That's home for all of us as believers in Jesus Christ who've received him as our Savior. And that's exactly what Jesus was teaching us about when the disciples came to him long ago and said, would you teach us to pray like John the Baptist's disciples? And he said, yes, I'll teach you. And he started the model prayer out, Our Father, who art where? In heaven. Now the heaven he's referring to, that Jesus is talking about in that prayer, is the third heaven. It's the one that's eternal and does not relate to our physical universe at all. Now I need to really explain this. When Moses says, in the beginning, and John uses those exact same words to start the Gospel of John centuries later. He says, in the beginning was the Word. Moses writes, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the beginning being spoken about is not eternity. Y'all, eternity had no beginning. You with me? No beginning, no end. Let's say it together. No beginning... No end. That's eternity. And the Lord taught us something that we need to focus on this morning. And it's in the Gospel of John. The Scripture says, 
God is spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You with me? Now, the spiritual dimension is eternity. And so we live in a parallel world, so to speak. There is the spiritual world where God resides. He is spirit. And those of us who worship Him must worship Him in our hearts. We must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That's where we get to know Him. If you are looking for God, and I've tried to say this to my atheist friends, my agnostic friends, uh, and I have many that are, by the way, either agnostic or atheist that I meet, and we become good friends. They're just like us. They're fellow seekers. But they just haven't looked in the right place yet. If you're looking for God in your intellect and you're looking for Him humanly in this physical dimension, you will never find Him. Never. That isn't where He is. He is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, in the beginning means the beginning of time. Tick, tick, tick. Um, I remember in seminary, one wonderful professor, who's probably the most intelligent one we had there, and was the world's largest seminary, so he was a good one. When we would come into class, he would look at us and say, Welcome frail creatures of dust. That's the way he greeted us every morning. Now, he was trying to get the point across that now we are physical, and that's very temporary. Have you all noticed how fast life goes by? How many of you that are a little older, I'm 74, you know my age, it goes by like that. Now, when you're young, it seems slow, but as you get older, you realize how quickly it really is. Our life is like a breath. The Lord said it's like a flower that blossoms and is gone the next day. So, we are here to go home to be with Him there. And that dimension is spiritual in nature. It's the only, only way you're going to get there. When you die, your body stays here. You're going to get a new one later. Alright? Now, they went to great effort on Bill last week. And Sharon and I laughed, and, and, and his son said he was in real estate in a major way in development. And his son said in a light moment um, at his service, the biggest um, real estate deal that Dad ever made was this week, $22 a square inch. Uh, they, they buried him in the most beautiful wall in the most absolutely gorgeous indoor chapel like a cathedral that you'd see in Europe, with beautiful fountains coming up, uh, is magnificent. I've never seen a, uh, never been in a service like it. And, but, really, that doesn't matter, because our bodies are not what matter. They're temporary. Y'all feel the church are getting a little bit rusty? <laughs> All right, mine gets creaky. Okay. <laughs> Now, I will be delighted to have a new glorified body in home, when I get home. But for now, I have this body, and I love it, and I appreciate it. Don't y'all? Okay. One of the great missionaries, he's a Methodist, his name was E. Stanley Jones. He was in India, and he discipled A.B. Maslamani, who was the head of the Bible Society of India for years. And Masi discipled me for a long time, to teach me how to witness to Hindus and to Muslims. And so I was in India a lot, and he came to the States to be our guest in Texas uh, several times as well to train me. And one day I said, you are the student, you were discipled by E. Stanley Jones, am I correct? And he said, yes. He said, I'm Baptist, E. Stanley Jones was Methodist, and he said he invested 16 years of my life to train me. And he said, I'll never forget the day when Dr. Jones was in the car. We were driving through India. And I noticed that he was praying real quietly. And I said, Dr. Jones, uh, could I join you in the prayer? What are you, what are you praying about? And he said, my knee. <laughs> and Moss, he said, your knee. He said, yes, I'm thanking God. He said, I'm over 80 now, 85, I think. 
He said, my knee has been so faithful to me and kind. And he said, I'm thanking God for my knee. And he said, could you join me in thanking God for my head? And they prayed and gave God thanks for E. Stanley Jones' head. All right. So it's perfectly fine for us to thank God for our human bodies. But aren't you glad that's not the end of the journey? When we die and we go home, we get a new body. Now, I need to take you a little deeper in the beginning. What does that really mean? I hope this will help for the rest of your journey. And I want to use my dad as an example because I loved him so much and he became a wonderful Christian. Oh, my. But he was an agnostic till he was 46 and Billy Graham led him to faith. And I think I've told you that before. In any event, dad was... Um, he had cancer, but he didn't know it. And I was taking him to the doctor, and the doctor told me that he had cancer. And I was driving him home to the ranch. And we were in the car, and Dad just sitting there quietly. And I said, Dad, what are you thinking about? And he said, Son, have you recently given any thought to the age of the son, meaning the physical son? And I'm like, no, Dad. I haven't given any thought recently to the age of the sun. That would be my dad. All right. And he said, well, I believe it's probably at a half-life. I doubt we have more than six billion years left before it completely burns out. Now, this is my father, all right? He thinks like that. Always did. And, and he was, oil and gas was his world, and he could find it because he thought like that. He could, he could find it. And he said, son... He said, from time to time, you need to stop and think about things like that because everything has an end. All right, what Dad's talking about is the physical world. Eternity has no end. And that's why at the end of the book of Revelation, when Jesus is referring to Himself, and we need to let this sink in, He said, I am Alpha and Omega. I am beginning and the end. I am the first, I am the last. Whew. This was no carpenter talking. This was the Son of the living God. Now that's what John is telling us about in the first verse of John. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. Come on. And the Word was God. Now how can you be with somebody and be them at the same time? The Trinity. That's what we didn't understand about Him. Yes, He existed forever. There is no beginning and our finite minds cannot understand something infinite in nature. We try. We fail. We can't do it. And that's the reason why you only get to know Him by faith. And thank the Lord for His kindness and mercy that He gave us the capacity to come to know Him in the simplest possible way. Faith. You say, well, Bill, illustrate it for me. Sure. This morning, we got up, planning to come here, and Carol Ann and I had coffee. That's our ritual. How many of you do that in the morning? Okay, nearly all of you. All right. When we drank that coffee, we believed it was safe to drink it. Nobody had poisoned it. It came from a good manufacturer, and therefore every morning we look forward to drinking it. In the sixth chapter of John, and you, those of you that are students, go home and study John 6. Jesus says, The bread that I give you is from heaven. It's not like Moses gave you that's physical. He said, I'm giving you spiritual bread, which is life. Eat me, and you'll never be hungry. Drink me, you'll never thirst again. He's talking spiritually. Now let these words sink in. John 6, 63. The words that I speak unto you are spirit, and they are life. Now what he did not say was, they are about spirit or about life. No, no. 
He said they are. That's the very essence of my words. This is why the soldiers went back after the crucifixion and there was another occasion earlier where the same thing basically happened. They said it a little differently. But they said this, no man ever spake the way this man speaks. And they were right. Because in the history of the world, nobody ever spoke spirit and life but him. Now when he said, I am bread, he did not literally mean I'm bread. And when he said, uh, eat my flesh in John 6, and it, oh, it, it repulsed the people. In fact, some of his disciples left him when he said it. And then he goes ahead though and explains it, and they never got it. Well, maybe they did later, we don't know. I hope they did. But he said, the words that I'm speaking to you are spiritual in nature. They are spirit and they are life. Don't look at it literally. There's two dimensions. If you want to understand the Bible, y'all, you're going to have to read it understanding that the words he's speaking are spirit and their life. And that's true from the beginning to the end. I feel sorry sometimes for uh, people that never can read the Bible and understand it because they're reading it as if it were physical literature, like a class book in a, in a university. I think I've told you this, but there are some here that weren't here. Years ago, uh, Dr. Graham's team gave me a job when I was their early intern, when my 20s. And my job was to train the American and British military in how to counsel with all the new believers coming to faith when Billy preached there in Berlin. And he did it for 10 nights. So I equipped 300 people to do this. Well, one of the people that came forward, and there were thousands that did, to give their lives to Christ. One night, it was so many, we, we, couldn't even, we couldn't even hold them on the soccer field. There were that many, thousands. And so, only the English-speaking ones came to me, or to our area. And there was one who was a university professor of history there in Berlin, brilliant man. And so uh, the counselors were trained that if they couldn't answer the questions, raise their hand, and I was supposed to go and help answer the question. Uh, I'm 23. <laughs> this professor of PhD in history in Berlin is probably 50. Good luck. So I sat down next to him and I said, sir, I'm not sure I can answer the questions you're asking, but I'll, I'll try my best to help you. He said, I heard Dr. Graham tonight, and what he said made sense. I got it. And he said, I believe there is a God, and I believe He sent His Son, and I'm accepting Him tonight as my Savior. He got it. And he said, what do I do next? I said, you need to read the Gospel of John. It's the deepest, clearest explanation of the identity of the Savior and the purpose of man that we have. And I'd like for you to see the very first verse. So I showed him, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he was just stunned. He said, oh my. And look at that next verse. He was with God in the beginning. That's a pronoun referencing the Word. And I noticed that the word has a capital W. I said, yes sir, you're right. The word was a person who always existed and is part of God's nature, part of the Trinity. Say it with me. Father, Son, Son Holy Spirit. Now we didn't know that. God progressively revealed it. Moses didn't understand it. That stayed a mystery that was slowly revealed to mankind as we could handle it and take it in. And some of us still haven't quite gotten it. You with me? Okay. Now, He is one, and He is three, and He's always been. Now, there was a time that we were not. You and I did not exist, and that's Mormon theology, y'all. It's no good. We did not pre-exist. Believe me, the Bible does not teach that. And I will be happy to talk with any Mormon about it. I do. 
Okay. We did not pre-exist. We were born when our parents lovingly, however we were privileged to be born, and y'all, we had not one thing to do with it. Not the time, not the family, not the country, nothing. We showed up, and we're here briefly to get to know God and to get to go home at the end of the journey. And he gives us the privilege, everybody the privilege, lovingly. And we're supposed to spend our time helping them understand the way home as Christians. That's our job. How good a job are we doing of it? Not as good as we should be. Do you all agree? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you know it and I know it. We're being too silent. And we're not being bold and talking to people the way we're supposed to. I want to encourage you to join me. Let's do it. Let's encourage each other to do it. I had the privilege of leading a waitress to Christ uh, in Houston last Sunday with a good friend of mine. Her name was Imagine. It was a real cute name. A uh, uh, black young lady in her 20s. And she was so thrilled to accept Christ as her Savior. You could see the change in her eyes when the Lord came in. Just like a dazzle, a sparkling. Now, the point here is that, and I want to go back to my story about the uh, professor. I said, just start reading, uh, just read the first chapter in the Gospel of John. And I said, if you eat a uh, read about a chapter a day, that's good, and it's for your soul and your spirit. How many of you like to eat physical food? Mm, I thought so. Me too. All right. I look forward to lunch today. I already know what I'm going to have, a pancake. All right. Now, we like to eat physically, but we need to eat and love God's Word to eat it. Because as we read the Word, it feeds our heart and our spirit and our soul. And so I told him that. And he said, well, I haven't done it for all these years. He said, I will do exactly what you say. And I had a prompting from the Lord in my heart. And I said, look, would you come back tomorrow night and listen to Dr. Graham again? He said, yes, I will. I said, all right, you've come forward tonight and given your life to Christ. You don't have to do that every, all the time. You do it, it's for good, if you mean it. I said, so if you meant it, meant it tonight, you don't need to come back and do that again. He said, I meant it. I said, all right. You come back and meet with me, not to pray about receiving Christ. You've already done that. He's in your heart now. He's with you forever, actually. But you come back and talk with me about questions you have of the first chapter of John. So he came back the next night, sat next to me. I said, how did you like the first chapter? Oh, he said it was magnificent. I've never read anything as interesting in my life. He said, in fact, I enjoyed the whole book. <laughs> I said, you read all of John? And he said, yes, but he said, you know, I'm a, a history professor here at the university. And he said, Acts was, he said, Acts was history. And I just couldn't stop reading. So I read uh, Acts and he said, you know, there's so much history in Rome. And he said, I, I had to read that book called Romans. I said, you read John, Acts, and Romans last night. He said, you know why I couldn't put the Bible down? He said, it's alive. It was like I, I was thirsty for it. I said, well, how much did you read? He said, I found Revelation difficult. <laughs> I said, you read the whole rest of the, of the New Testament? He said, yes, I never went to sleep. I read it all the way through, and I've taught today, and I came back to hear Dr. Graham, and I'm sitting by you. What do I do next? <laughs> and I prayed SOS. Lord, what do I tell him? I said, sir, I want you to start over and do the same thing again, but slowly. And this time, as you read, don't read it for intellectual understanding. Read it 
so that your character and your life and the way you live it will be transformed by it. And ask God to do that miracle in your heart. All right? Faith without action or works is what? Dead. Now, Carol Ann told me this morning, and sometimes she helps me with my sermons. Pretty often, actually. She said, honey, don't fail to mention Satan, please. All right, I, and I'm going to do that right now. Do you know that James tells us that the devil believes in God and trembles? Because of the coming judgment and the, the, what's coming in his future. The devil can believe, but that doesn't get him home to heaven. Because he doesn't have any desire for obedience. And Jesus said four times, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yes, we are saved by our faith. But we demonstrate the faith and its reality by a change in the way we think and live. The way we treat our fellow human beings. The way, the, the way we treat the internal revenue. The way we live and act. And we are to be examples of the beauty and the holiness and the purity and the grace and every attribute of our Savior. The Scripture says that we are in process of being conformed to the image of Christ. That's the objective of Christianity. And then we get to go home. Now, let me go back to Dad just for a moment. In the beginning is in the beginning of time. Tick, tick. That's human, y'all. That is, uh, oh, it's not just human, it's bigger than that. That is physical. When God created the heavens and the earth, one of those heavens was the stars and the universe, Genesis verse 1, that I talked about earlier. And before there were molecules, and before there was anything to decay, you could, time had no, there was no time. Time is directly related to change, decay, and decline. Think about it. Just think about it. How do you know that somebody's older when you look at them? There's change. Y'all agree? Less here for me. All right? Now, how do you know that a building has aged? It's declined. And if you don't maintenance it a lot, it's going to completely be destroyed over several hundreds of thousands of years. Go to Europe, you'll see it instantly. Now, I'm trying to make a point here. Eternity is not eternal tick, 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 tick. That is not what eternity is. Eternity is the absence of any ticks at all. And that's why the Bible says, and I looked it up just again yesterday and thought a lot about it, and time shall be no more. No more. When we're home, there'll be no time. You'll be in the presence of the loving, living God who created you, and I will too. And we'll get to have the privilege of being with our loved ones, our forefathers, those who will live after us, if Christ doesn't come back for some period of time, and I don't know when He's coming. But the point is this. We'll be together. In the resurrection, He also had that kind of body. And He was able to be wherever He wanted to be when He wanted to be there. Go back and look at it. It's very interesting. He shows up in a room, goes right through the wall. Because the molecular structure has nothing to do with his spiritual being and body in the other dimension. I don't know how close heaven is. It could be a few feet away from us is where it starts. Or inches. I don't know. But wherever it is, God made it. And he's there. 
And that's where Jesus is gone to prepare a place for us. You remember how he said, don't worry, don't be troubled. This is again in John. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. Now why did he say that? And I need to, I'm going to speed this up because of time. Why did he say that? Because the people at the day when He was born were looking for the coming of the Messiah. And they had believed for centuries that He was coming. Many centuries. And little by little, God had revealed more about Him and that He was coming. All the prophecies. And um, I usually preach on that on Easter. But there were tons of prophecies about His coming that Jesus fulfilled. He rode into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey. He had pierced pierce hands and feet as David said he would. They gambled for his clothes as David predicted that they would. He fulfilled prophecy after prophecy. He was born in Bethlehem as was prophesied that he would. He was a Nazarene as he, it was prophesied that he would be. Etc., etc., etc. Now, all of this is to help us understand that there will be no aging in the future when we go home. Eternity is not, there's no aging in eternity. And in order that we can understand that he was physically, bodily resurrected, and he wasn't just a spirit. He asked the disciples to give him what? Food. Fish and honey that he could eat and they could see that the food stayed in him and didn't just pass through him like a ghost or a spirit. So the, the new body that we'll receive is something I don't understand. I don't need to. Neither do you. But we'll receive it. And it will be like our Lord's. And that is something we can look forward to. Now, I'm... I'm laughing at myself. I forgot totally about my message. <laughs> All right. You take, you can take the scripture home. And I want you just to, I'm just going to make one point because my time is gone in the prologue. Um, and any of you that wanted the sermon I didn't preach, I made 29 copies of it. It's on the left hand side back on the wall there. And you're welcome to take it. All right. Here's what I want you to understand. With Lazarus, y'all know the story perfectly well. Mary and Martha, his sisters, they went out of concern and asked the Lord to come, hoping that he could come quick enough to heal Lazarus. He waited intentionally and didn't. Did it on purpose. Two days he stayed where he was. Then he goes. Lazarus has already been in the tomb four days. And he has this conversation with, with uh, Martha. If you'll look down, please, uh, on this right quick, you'll see it. Go to verse 4. Uh, when Jesus heard it, he said, This sickness will not end in death, but it is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Okay? Let me take you down further. And he's talking with the disciples. Verse 11. He then told them, our friend Lazarus has what? Fallen asleep. That is what Jesus consistently calls death. And our way home. Y'all, if we didn't die, we couldn't go there. Hallelujah for death. It's a blessing, not a curse. It's our escape. You wouldn't want to live here. Well, Dr. Graham, just think, he died last year. Or... When it, when it, a few months ago. Uh, he was 99 and, and a few months. His body had given up. He wanted to go home. And you and I will get to that same place. Amen? Amen. And you've seen your parents or loved ones uh, be there. But you, it's your forwarding address that matters, y'all. <laughs> you want to have eternal life, not eternal life death and the difference is if you don't get forgiveness for your sin 
And if you don't eat the bread of eternal life, if you don't drink Christ, if you don't invite him in, you don't have eternal life because he is eternal life. You've got to get him here inside. With me? Okay, I'm, I'm going to... When he said he's fallen asleep and I'm going to go wake him up, they looked at him and they were thinking physically just like you and I would have. And they said, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be fine. He'll be well. You're not going to go back where they tried to stone you a few weeks ago in Judea, are you? That's where Bethany is. Right outside of Jerusalem, about two hours walk. And he said, yeah. But he said, I'm telling you plainly, he died. Now he was speaking spiritually to them when he said, asleep. When the young lady, the young girl fell asleep and the father came and said, please come help my daughter. And he said, I'll come. And they were all mourning and weeping because she had died. He said, move away. And he comes in and says, wake up. We're going to wake up. And you will not know that time has passed. At Bill's graveside, I looked at his granddaughter who's uh, eight. And I said, Camille, do you ever sleep? She said, yes, sir. I said, do you know how much time has passed when you're asleep? She said, no, sir. Neither will we. The second coming will be the instant when you die. But you won't know it. Because you stepped out of human time, tick, 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 into eternity where time doesn't exist. And this is why the Lord said, with God a thousand years is like a... and a day is like a thousand years. That's the point He was making. Now, if you want to be ready, then listen really hard to what I'm telling you and then we're going to close. And I will have a prayer. But it could be the most important prayer you ever prayed. I don't know your heart. You alone know where you are on your journey. I cannot know. Not some time back, um, a physical therapist was helping me with uh, my feet because I have a lot of pain in them, particularly the left one because of two surgeries. And I'm diabetic, so I have to watch them. So she was helping me, and I had a long drive, uh, 200 miles to go that night before preaching the next morning. And I was in another state. And she said, I'm Roman Catholic. And she said, I opened up on Saturday to help you because I think I need your help as much as you need mine. I said, what is it? I Help me. She said, I am considering becoming a Buddhist. And I need to know whether you think I should become a Buddhist or remain a Roman Catholic. And I said, well, I think we do need each other. I said, let me ask you this. I said, every good Roman Catholic believes in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. She said, absolutely, and I do. I said, all right. Let me ask you this. Would you feel comfortable believing in a God that's like a cloud that is intangible and doesn't really have a name and identity and a way of relating to that God? She said, absolutely not. I said, well, you'd make a really bad Buddhist. I said, I don't think that's going to work for you. She smiled and said, is it that simple? I said, pretty much. Because religion is no better or worse than its concept of God. Hinduism has 400,000 gods. Buddhism has one foggy... Uh, it's, it's more of a philosophical concept. Really like a cloud is the way I put it. Than a... like Jehovah. So she got it. She understood. She said, alright, now talk to me about why my Roman Catholic faith is not working for me. I said, no, no, no. I said, look, let's talk. I said, there are great strengths in Catholicism, and one of them is being Trinitarian. Also, their worshipfulness. You can go in a Catholic 
monastery or place of worship, and people are very worshipful. I said, but there's a weak spot, several, and I need to talk to you about a big one. She said, what is it? I said, you gave me a cup of water when I came in uh, today. And she said, yes. And I said, do you really believe that's water? I pointed to it. She said, yeah, H2O, it's water. I said, theoretically, and I want you to really think about it, could I hold that in my hand for days and be thirsty and die of thirst if I never got liquid into my body any other way? And I had it right there in my hand. She thought about it. She said, if you held it long enough and didn't drink water from any other source, yeah, you could die of thirst holding that water in your hand. I just sat and let her think. I said, did our Lord not say in John, drink me and you'll never thirst again? She said, oh. I said, there's your problem. You're not taught in Catholicism unless it's a rare priest to internalize Jesus Christ and to ask Him to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior. If you do it, You'll do it on your own reading the Bible or worshiping, but you will not usually be taught to do it. She said, I've been a Roman Catholic all these years and I've never once been taught to do it. I said, that's typical. I have many Catholic friends who are better Catholics now because they prayed and asked Christ into their heart. And some have left the Catholic Church, some have stayed. That's, not, that's their decision as they grow. She said, I've never done it. Can you tell me how to do it? Now, I'm going to tell you how to do it because I've been with Dr. Graham on dozens and dozens and dozens of... Uh, no, I can't count the times that I've seen him do it and that I've followed his example and done the same thing. This little booklet, and we have... I bring them every year, is by Billy Graham. And there's a prayer in the back. We call it the Sinner's Prayer. Let me give you the gist of it. There's no magic in the words. God looks upon the where? The heart. Together, God looks upon the heart. If in your heart, like the lady I've just told you about, you've been searching for Him, and you're not quite sure you found Him, but you want to find Him, He's here. He's everywhere. And He's waiting for you to open the door of your heart and invite Him in and make Him Lord and Master and Savior. And He said, if I, let, if I come in, you'll never thirst again. I am the bread of life. I'm the water of life. You want hunger? You want thirst. You'll grow. And if you don't change and find progress in your spiritual life, it means you didn't do it right. You're with me? The Scripture says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, and old things pass away in this life, and all things become new. So look for that. It'll happen. And it'll happen quickly, too. Alright, here's the prayer. The gist of it. Lord, I'm a sinner. Now, if you don't know you're sick, you're never going to go to a doctor. Lord, I'm a sinner. You know what sinners need? Forgiveness. When I get sick, I go right here to Lake Toxway to the doctor. We're good friends. He's so kind, he calls me at home to check on me to make sure I'm well. He wants me to be well to go out and minister. And when I get sick, I'll go to him. He said, Billy, what's the problem? I said, I, same old thing, respiratory. I had this paralyzed right diaphragm. And he'll say, antibiotics will knock it out. If I don't have those antibiotics, I could get pneumonia and be in real trouble. If you're a sinner, and we all are, every one of us, how many of y'all agree with that? We are. We just got to be humble and admit it. Honest. We need a Savior. Well, it won't do any good to have a Savior, savior that's hanging on the cross. No, nope, that's not where He wants to be. He wants to be like bread, living bread and living water 
in our hearts. His love for us and his message to us is spiritual in nature. So I'm going to ask you to pray a very simple prayer. We'll all pray it individually. We'll not pray it out loud. We'll just let you pray it individually. I'm going to lead you in the prayer. And it's going to say, I'm a sinner, but I'm sorry. I need your help. I want to receive you. I know that you've been knocking on the door of my heart for a long time. I feel it today. I don't want to guess or hope that I'm going home. I want to know for dead sure that you're my Savior and my heart and that I belong to you and that when I die, it won't be I hope I'm going to heaven. I can hardly wait to get there. You remember what Dr. Graham said? He said, one of these days you're going to hear that I'm dead. He said, don't you believe it a minute. <laughs> he said, I'll be more alive than I've ever been. And I'll be with my Savior. And he said, and it won't be because I preach sermons to thousands of people. It will be because of what Jesus Christ did for me in love on the cross and his resurrection. You with me? Has nothing to do with us. Has everything to do with him. Are you ready? Let's bow together. Now you listen to the words as I pray the sinner's prayer. And let it come from the depths of your heart and soul. Lord Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner. And I want you to know today that I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. The thoughts and the deeds. And I ask you to come into my heart. I'm taking you as living bread, which is symbolized by communion. I'm taking you as living water so that I will never thirst again for you. Come into my heart. Take control of my life. Be my Savior and be my guide. Be my Master. Change in me everything that's displeasing to you. And help me to become the man or woman that you want me to be. And may I be your witness and tell others about you. Take control of my finances. Take control of my business. Take control of our home. And may everything that you've given me be used for your glory and for your service. And I pray this, Lord, in the strong and beautiful name of Jesus Christ, your Son, whom I have accepted as my Savior. Dear Lord, you've heard our prayers, individually and collectively. We ask that today might become a life-changing day, not only for those of us that are accepting you today, but for those of us who have walked with you for years and need to be better witnesses in telling others about you. And so we pray, Father, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, your word might do its work in a new way in our hearts. If you join me in this prayer, would you all say amen with me? Amen. amen.